At this point, picking up a Wii U gamepad is like dusting off an ancient tablet. It's old, crusty, and forgotten, but like ancient texts, it too has interesting stories to tell. Even though it was a commercial failure, the Wii U was a pretty cool console. It had great first-party support despite the short shelf life, and having that second screen for maps and inventory was unbelievably convenient. Though while initially strong with ports, the thing never really found proper footing with third parties because nobody seemed to be able to really find any meaningful use for the thing. Around the time Nintendo launched the Wii U, they were already pretty close with many third parties, including Team Ninja of Koei Tecmo, who they got to develop Other M and Hyrule Warriors, both to varying degrees of success. This relationship with Koei Tecmo extended into owning a share of the Fatal Frame series. With Nintendo experimenting with hardware, it's pretty easy to understand why this series interested them. The idea of taking pictures is sort of a natural fit for motion-focused hardware. Finally, we had a series that could actually figure out a way to make good use of the gamepad. They played around with the idea of aiming a camera with gyro control and spirit camera on 3DS, but they wouldn't really do a full game around this idea until the next proper installment. Shortly after Fatal Frame 5's announcement, people began to wonder if we'd even get the game in the West. The series never really did big numbers over here, and the previous main entry never did get localized. In the end, the fifth game would make its way stateside this time, albeit only as a digital download. We never got a physical version like Japan did. Europe got this awesome collector's edition, but over here, we had to deal with this giant downloadable file that didn't even even fit on some Wii U's. What a goddamn mess this was. The cheaper Wii U's only had 8 gigabytes of space on it. You know how big the game was? Yup. Even with a 32 gig model, it was still a pain in the ass to get this thing installed. I had to delete a ton of stuff. I imagine an external hard drive would have been very handy right about now, but the thing is, why would I dedicate an entire external to my Wii U in 2019, right? <laughs> Sorry, but I've got more important things for this guy. It was a messy launch, especially here in North America. Not only was it cumbersome as hell to even download and play, but it wasn't received all that well either either. It seemed like Fatal Frame was no longer the series we used to know and love. This was the first Fatal Frame game I actually remember seeing a lot of back when it first came out, because, like any of their other products, Nintendo was pushing it hardcore. I've always been interested in trying it at least once just to, you know, see what it's like, but there's always been so many hurdles, including a full retail price that still hasn't gone down. But I guess now I finally have a real excuse to play it, the final Fatal Frame game, at least as of this video. Did it end with a whimper, a bang, or something in between? Let's see. Oh man, booting up the Wii U nowadays is such a depressing sight. What used to be a plaza bustling full of other users sharing their experiences is now a cold purgatory of placeholder me's repeating the same tutorialized phrases again and again. Been playing Fatal Frame? Sorry buddy, but I don't think they care. I can't even look at this, this is just too depressing. <laughs> Let's start the game. Fatal Frame, Maiden of Black Water. Kinda weird they dropped the number for this one. It is the official fifth major entry in the series, and most people do just call it Fatal Frame 5, but yeah, I keep forgetting this one isn't actually a numbered entry for some reason. My guess would be that since it is the first one in a long time, especially for the West, and on a different console than before, they wanted to make the game seem more accessible to people, maybe not as familiar with the series. So for any Wii U owners that are new to the series, it'd be a little easier for them to buy it without really feeling like they're missing four games prior. It's it's just marketing, and yeah, that would make sense. You wouldn't really be missing much if you played this one first, anyway. Like most games in the series, while loosely connected, the plot is self-contained, and while it does pick up on certain events from the first game, it's still possible to follow along without playing it. This game's story begins with a young girl named Miyu searching for her mother. She went missing on Mount Hikami, a mountain infamous for being a popular suicide spot, as well as being full of evil spirits, because, and you freaking guessed it, of a failed ritual. Soon into her search, Miyu stumbles upon this sealed box, and we see an evil spirit emerge from it. And that's the last we hear from her, at least for now. We then cut to this young girl named Yuri. Uh, fun fact, if you played Smash Ultimate, you might recognize her as one of the assist trophies. 
Yuri is the main protagonist of Fatal Frame 5. You do bounce between three different characters like you did in Fatal Frame 3, but for the most part, Yuri is the primary protagonist. She works at an antique shop with this woman who took her in after saving her from a suicide attempt. Yuri has a long troubled past dealing with her ability to see the supernatural. She has what's called a shadow reading, which allows her to see someone's final moments before death when she makes contact with a ghost. The game opens with the two heading to Mount Hikami to do some research for Ren Hojo, who's this author that the two are close friends with. The majority of the game takes place on this mountain, more specifically in the woods, with a number of different abandoned buildings you'll explore as you progress through the game. It's closer to how Fatal Frame 2 handled its world structure, but with a large forest instead of an abandoned village, and I did really like this. Having a number of self-contained buildings instead of one giant one helps alleviate confusing backtracking, which was my biggest problem with the third game. And the atmosphere is is fairly decent. The lighting effects are pretty great and the attention to detail in the environment are quite good. There is a solid variety of interesting locations too, like an abandoned cable car station, this beach area with this big intimidating landscape, and my favorite, this Japanese tunnel near a phone booth, an absolute classic set piece in Japanese infrastructure. The controls did take some getting used to though, and no, I don't mean the motion controls, I mean just like walking. It has this weird weight to it that it didn't before as if they wanted to emulate the weight of a human body on real legs, but man, it just kind of feels like you're pushing a boulder the whole time. It's weird to explain without playing it yourself, but it feels way heavier than it needs to be. Also, it seems like they couldn't make up their mind as to what'll dictate the direction the character's facing. Like, uh, some games have the character always facing the same direction the camera is, and other games the camera and character are completely independent from one another. But Fatal Frame 5 has this weird middle ground where it is independent from the camera, until you start moving it, and now they're trying to look where the camera's looking, but since it has that heavier movement, your character clunkily stumbles to face the direction you're looking, despite the direction you're trying to make them walk, and they start doing these weird sidestep shuffles, but they rotate, like, into that, and it's like, what are what are you doing? Please, just, just walk where I want you to walk, and let me look where I'm trying to look, please. It's not a major problem, but it really tripped me up every now and then. As you make your way through each chapter, you'll, of course, encounter plenty of ghosts you'll have to exercise with the camera obscura, and this is where the Wii U gamepad comes into play. When entering first person, you'll bring up the gamepad and look through the controller screen, as if you're looking through a camera, and then you'll use a gyro motion to aim at any nearby spirits. You can still use the sticks to move and aim your view, so I would usually use the right stick to find the ghost and then use the motion to track it from there. The game does this really interesting thing where you'll tilt the controller to line up the shot so you can do more damage. Instead of charging your shots like in previous games, damage dealt is now determined by the number of weak points in the frame when the photo is taken. These weak points are indicated by these little circles here, so basically what you want to do is line up the shot to get as many of them in the frame as possible when you take the photo, so just like real photography, you'll find yourself rotating the camera from landscape to portrait depending on the situation. I have to admit this is actually kind of cool. I, I do think it's a really great way of keeping the combat fresh while including another actual nod to how real photography works, but uh, with that said, it's not perfect. You have to remember to bring up the gamepad before you hit the button, because the gyro controls come to play the second you enter first person. So if you hit the button and then bring it up, your view's gonna shoot up to the sky and you're gonna be very disoriented. This was really annoying, because my instinct is to hit the button while bringing it up, one single motion, and it was really difficult to disconnect that sort of muscle memory. And I also feel like the right stick just isn't sensitive enough. Moving it left and right has this sluggish startup before you start rotating at a good speed, even at the highest sensitivity options, so scanning the environment with the sticks doesn't really feel as good as it used to in older games. This is especially annoying when a ghost appears behind you, because part of you is just going to want to turn around with the controller, because that will be more accurate and responsive than this freaking molasses stick, but doing a 180 with the controller is really disorienting. And I'm going to be honest, I sometimes don't really feel like bringing the gamepad up to my face to play the game, so I'll try to get away with just looking down at it and tilting it in my lap but this often doesn't give you the results you want. Tilting the gamepad when it's facing downwards doesn't usually give you the correct motion, so you really can't lazy out on it. You have to play this as intended. You will at the very least have to look at the controller's screen, because there's a lot of info on the gamepad that isn't on the TV. The ghost's health, their weak points, how much film you have, which film type is equipped, your power-ups, all of it on the bottom screen. So when you're in combat, you're going to be looking down there, not up here. Getting from one place to another is more straightforward than ever. In 
fact, it's been dumbed down to an almost insulting degree, where many prior games would have you explore the area and figure out where to go and see these visions of ghosts to, you know, guide you in the right direction. Fatal Frame 5 has a button that creates one of these spirits at any time you want. Yeah, remember the where do I go button in Dead Space? It's literally that. You push the ZR button and follow the glowy man. It could not be more handholdy. I had no incentive to explore freely whatsoever because the entire thing was a game of follow the leader. And yeah, there's still items to find, but they're not really tucked away all that well this time. You'll see almost all of them on the main path. There's no way you're gonna miss them. I guess there's some more if you stray from the beaten path and look around, but the extra items you really don't need because this game gives you so freaking many as it is. God, and I thought Fatal Frame 2 was bad for this. A Fatal Frame 5 gives you more healing items than you could ever hope to use. Even when I was getting lazy and just tanking hits without making any effort to dodge, I was able to go gobble these up non-stop and still have plenty at all times. This is the easiest game in the series by a significant margin. All sense of survival is completely destroyed by the dump truck loads of healing items the game throws at you. And not just that, but this is also the first game in the series to not boot you back to a save point when you die. You only get sent back to a fairly recent checkpoint, so there's barely any consequence for game overs to begin with now. If you're looking for a challenging survival horror game, look somewhere else because this ain't it. And the game's still at it with those stupid hand thing jump scares, just in case it didn't get old the first time. And I don't mean the first game that did it, I mean the first time it happened in the first game that did it. It got old, it is still old, and they're making it even older. Please stop! This, sadly enough, is the game's only real attempt at being scary. Like 4, I didn't really find this one very scary at all. Ghost encounters remain just as unsubtle and evident as they were in 4, and the ghosts themselves aren't very intimidating or scary. They all just kind of look like people. This guy looks like a drunk salary man. Well, I guess there are some exceptions. It's a rare encounter, you might not even see this ghost on a single playthrough, but if you run into this thing, dear lord is it unsettling. The proportions of this ghost are so freaky. I wish the game had more stuff like this, more wilder ghost designs. It really freaked me out when I ran into her. Apparently this ghost is actually a reference to a fairly old but very popular Japanese creepypasta. It's really cool to see AAA developers pay tribute to online horror communities like that. Though I do wonder what my perspective on this would be if I were Japanese instead of Canadian. You know, as somebody that's never heard of this, it's really cool to me, but then again, I see Slenderman and stuff, and I roll my eyes at it, you know? So, like, that's kind of interesting. I wonder how I would feel towards it if it weren't for my, like, North American perspective, you know? This game does do a fairly good job of getting you to recognize the spirits. Uh, between the Shrine Maidens, the Suicide Victims, and many others, there was plenty of times where I made those satisfying connections to these ghosts and the reading materials, so that's one thing the series is still quite good at. And if this game's good at anything the series has never been good at, it's that you can finally actually run now. Thank God, too, because some of those treks through the forest can be pretty lengthy. It'd take forever if you could only do a light jog like every other game. That is one thing about this game's structure that I wasn't too big on. Like usual, it is chapter-based, but this time you start back at the antique shop at the beginning of most chapters, instead of landing you precisely where you'll need to be. The reason you keep going back to this mountain is a little bit infuriating. You're essentially looking for people that have gone missing there, but after you bring them back, a ghost will just possess them again and make them go back to the mountain, and then you have to save them again. It's a pretty obvious plot device that only exists so you have a hub to keep going back to. With a game that keeps coming back to a common area, you need to keep making excuses why they're going back and forth, and the ones they come up with in this game are pretty freaking weak. Like, come on, you saved them, but they went back, and now you have to save them again. It is frustratingly lazy writing. The game also makes you re-explore the same buildings multiple times as different characters, and the routes you take aren't really different enough to really warrant it. Like this chapter, you explore this house as Yuri for a legitimate story reason, but later you re-explore it as Hojo with them just making up some random dumb excuse this time. Your assistant went missing and now you gotta go find her. It's this super brief pointless subplot that feels so shoehorned in just to fill time. There's a lot of padding in this game. It happens a number of times, redoing a level as another character, making up some 
half-baked excuse that doesn't really serve the story in a meaningful way. It stretches out the game much longer than it needs to be. It's about a 15-hour game, but I would much rather a more meaningful 8 hours than a blatantly stretched out 15 hours. There is this one really unique part of the game where, as the people you've rescued stay the night in the antique shop, Hojo has to monitor security cameras to make sure nobody gets possessed and tries to go back to the mountain. You'll watch the camera feeds on the TV with the location map being on the gamepad, and if you see any unusual activity, you'll run to the corresponding part of the house and exercise any spirit you'll find. I can't help but to wonder though, why does he have security cameras in their bedrooms? He could be watching them getting changed! Oh wait, you know what? That's probably why they're sleeping in their clothes, because they know this dude's watching. But jokes aside, as freaking cool as this part is, they make you do it again later. And it's like, yeah, it is a cool idea, but we really didn't need to do this twice. The game tends to dwell on the few good ideas it has, just for the sake of artificially increasing playtime. Well, I guess all there's left to talk about is the game's story, so yeah, here's that spoiler warning. Skip here if you'd like to avoid hearing about the story details. I'll try to cover it as best as I can, but like, be warned, I found it a little more confusing than other plots in the series, so apologies if I get shit wrong. Okay, so there seems to be like three kinda ongoing plots at the same time that sort of intertwine, but like, don't really go together all the time, at least not in the way that they did in 3 and 4. Miyu's story is all about finding her mother, who turned turns out to be Miku, the protagonist of Fatal Frame 1. It turns out after losing her brother Mafuyu, she had this obsessive feeling that she was doomed to be alone, so she marries the ghost of Mafuyu and has a kid with him somehow? I have only one question. Who do I have to slap? Who wrote this? Why did they write this? Miyu's an incest child because her mother was impregnated by the ghost of her own brother. Why did they do that? Miku explains all of this during Miyu's ending, heavily implying that Mafuyu is her father, which means he's also her uncle, and Miku's also her aunt? Like, Miku's her, like, mom, aunt, and I hate this. Somebody please expunge this from my memory. I never want to think about this again. And listen, I understand that horror games are a great space to explore taboo topics. When you sign up for something you know is going to be horrifying, it strangely becomes a more comfortable environment to discuss things like murder and rape and abuse and other things. It's quite ironic that such an awful and dangerous world can be a sort of safe zone for discussing these things, but like, there's a difference between respectfully covering sensitive material and then having some batshit weird ass malarkey like this. What the hell were they thinking? Well, let's move on to Hojo. Uh, he's been having this recurring dream where, as a child, he's part of a ritual in which he sacrifices a young girl with white hair. These dreams become so vivid that he starts to wonder if this was a real memory that he forced himself to forget. It later turns out that these dreams are actually the memories of his descendant, Kunihiko Aso, the creator of the Camera Obscura. She was a childhood friend of his, and after the two grew quite close, he was heartbroken that he had to kill her in the ritual. Little fun fact, uh, Misaki from 4 is also a descendant of his, hence having the same last name. Aso was invited to- it sounds like I'm saying asshole, I'm so sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Aso was invited to Mount Hikami to photograph the shrine maiden there, uh, Usei Kurosawa, and during the photography session, the two fell into an unspoken love parting ways without telling each other how they truly felt. She was then to take part in the pillar ritual in which they closed maidens into a large black box, being alone forever. I don't remember why they do this or what purpose it serves, I don't even know if that's like mentioned, but whatever. Uh, she's in the box and she has these newfound feelings for her asso, uh, along with the fact that this angry nut job came and slaughtered all the shrine maidens and of course the ritual fails and Kudasawa now re-emerges from the black box as an evil spirit that would haunt Mount Hikami. The area would then go on to become a popular suicide spot for people that felt as if they were alone. The curse would draw these sorts of people in supernaturally, which is why Miku was drawn to the mountain. Yuri here was also drawn to the mountain for the same reason. Her supernatural abilities to see the dead made her feel isolated, and the cursed mountain drew her in because of it. However, since she was safe by a friend who assured her that she was in fact not alone, Yuri was able to take that experience and do the same for Kurosawa during the final encounter. This is the final boss, and it is super easy. 
there's really nothing to it. But I gotta say, visually, it's pretty cool. You bounce between two phases, one underwater and one at the surface. You'll get one of two endings depending on where you are when you finish the fight. One ending has Kudasawa accepting being alone and then passing on peacefully, while the other has her convincing Yuri to die as well since they share similar experiences. It's a pretty cut and clear good ending versus bad ending. Now those aren't the only two endings, just the two that Yuri gets. During the final chapter, you'll see all three of the playable characters meet a different fate as the chapter progresses, ending finally with Yuri. Miyu has two outcomes, depending on whether or not you took Miku's photograph as you followed her up the mountain, essentially one where Miku lives and one where she doesn't. Again, it's pretty clear bad versus good ending. Now, Hojo, on the other hand, has a number of endings. You have to conduct another ghost marriage ritual, so you choose between the girl Aso sacrificed or Kudosawa. The outcomes with the little girl flash back to when they were children, kind of just showing more of what happened back then and how Aso left the situation. But if you choose Kurosawa, you can choose to either embrace her or take her picture. If you do the former, you get this ending where Aso and Kurosawa make amends and confess their love to each other, and then part ways peacefully. And the latter is a similar ending, but with a lot less detail. So here's why it gets a bit clunky. It's because while Hojo's story explores Aso's past and the ghost marriage ritual, and Yuri's story explores the other rituals and the fate of the Shrine Maidens, Miyu's story is totally unrelated. It's just about her finding Miku. If she wasn't here, the plot would be no different. Yuri's and Hojo's stories intertwine, and Miyu just feels like she's there for the sake of being there. It feels like they included it just to be able to bring back an older character for the sake of fan service. And of course, they just had to do the absolute weirdest thing with it too. Uh, between these two characters, I think the plot's okay, but Miyu's side of it just doesn't really feel all that relevant to the bigger picture. I don't know, the plot's a little bit messy. Like, I always felt like there's a lot going on, but I never really understood why a lot of it was going on, and not in the it's a horror game or making you confused and afraid sort of way, but in a why'd they write this sort of way, if you know what I mean. Uh, I can at least say it doesn't hold a candle to any of the prior game's plots. Uh, as far as the series standards go, it's at least weak by comparison. If you get most of these endings, you can once again unlock the super fun Nintendo costumes. A Zero Suit Samus costume for Yuri, and a full-blown Princess Zelda costume for Miyu. Uh, Hojo didn't get anything, unfortunately. It would have been cool if he got like a Captain Falcon costume or something. That would have been sick. The reason he didn't get one is actually sort of interesting. Thing. It's because these costumes are actually replacements for these unlockable bikini costumes the girls had in the Japanese version, but I guess Nintendo thought they were a little too risque for us in the West. I mean, the game's already rated M, I don't think it would have really much mattered, but honestly, I do think these Nintendo costumes are way more fun, so despite the censorship, there was a pretty great silver lining here, and I do really appreciate that. I mean, they could have just removed it and had nothing in its place, right? But instead, they went out of their way to still have something worth unlocking. And you guys know I'm all about those funny costumes. It makes me wonder what kind of Nintendo costumes we could see in the next Fatal Frame. I think a Captain Olimar outfit would be pretty hilarious. I can imagine that big bull helmet on the character, but let's go full-blown stupid. I say Tom Nook mascot costume. Imagine fumbling around a haunted mansion in this. Come on, Nintendo, make it happen. Gigantic shout out to Nimbrock Rock for doing these concept models for me. Throw the guy a follow. He does great 3D stuff. All right, what else do we got? Okay, there's one last thing. There's this bonus mission you can unlock where you play as Ayane from Ninja Gaiden, or uh, is she from Dead or Alive? I don't know which one came first, I don't know, I've never played any of those games, but either way, it's just a little bonus, you'll fly through it pretty quickly, but it is a really cool addition if you're a fan of either of those series. And that is Fatal Frame 5. Uh, yeah, I definitely see why a lot of people didn't seem to care for it when it was new. It is it is just very watered down over past titles, uh, no pun intended. Uh, the progression is very oversimplified, it is ridiculously linear, it's completely lacking in proper challenge and survival, and it is padded out with a lot of obvious filler. And of course, the mandatory motion controls would probably turn a lot of people off. Uh, that last one is quite subjective, but I do recognize that it is a very dividing feature of the game. It does have a couple of great ideas, though. I do really like what they did with the gamepad being the camera, you know, tilting the frame to get as many weak points in as possible. It was a great way of keeping the combat fresh. The motion control has its hiccups, but it does work decently enough to be at least an interesting way to play. But while I don't have a problem with motion controls like this, I know a lot of people do prefer traditional button layouts over motion control, especially when that's how the older games played. So I think moving forward, optional gyro assist, similar to Breath of the 
Wild and Mario Odyssey, that would be the ideal way to incorporate it rather than making it the sole focus of the gameplay. But based on the producer's recent comments about how he'd like to make a Fatal Frame on Switch for you fling the thing around in portable mode, I'm not super confident that the series is going to be headed in that direction. Well, one final point I guess before I end this video, I have to admit it was really nice to finally see a Fatal Frame game with high definition graphics. It's a pretty good looking game, definitely has that first party polish, the models all look great, the lighting and colors are good, and it was also pretty nice to see a game from this era with real reflections, you know, I feel like we didn't have those for a whole generation. I guess I'd say it's the most average Fatal Frame game, like, it does have some really interesting ideas and some strengths, but all of its weaknesses just make it painfully mediocre. I definitely feel more indifferent to this one than any other title in the series. It's not really worth hating, but not really worth playing either. Unless you're very curious, you're not really missing much by skipping this one. So, that concludes the Fatal Frame Marathon. Uh, if that Switch Fatal Frame game ever does come to fruition, I'll definitely be checking that out here on the channel, but until then, I'm gonna be hanging up the camera for now. Next time I deal with ghosts, it's gonna be a via vacuum. So, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this review series, and I guess I'll see you guys again sometime soon. See ya.